Turn in your Bible to John chapter 8, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, John the Gospel. And this story to me, uh, I, I love this story for a lot of reasons. One, it speaks to something that's happening in our culture right now. And people ask me all the time, Is the, are, are the scriptures really relevant to 21st century living? Does it really speak to us in 2024? And the, this message I'm going to give you today speaks loud and clear to us. How do you handle people who've really messed up? How, what is your response? What is our response to another human being when they have really broken the rules? I mean, they, they've really messed up. What kind of punishment do you want to give them, but you would rather avoid yourself? <laughs> this is the age that we're living in, right? We're living in a cancel culture age where the tendency is to believe every bad report of your enemy and to believe only the best about your friends. And that's what social media algorithms are telling us to do, that those people, I'm not pointing left for a reason, I'm just using that as an example, but those people are evil and those people are evil. And in other words, we, we believe every negative thing about people that are not like us and we agree with every pe thing that, with people that are just like us. So we're going to see this, this uh, dynamic play out inside a church building. So Jesus is in the temple. He's about to teach. And suddenly chaos, anger, loud noises breaks out in the synagogue. Let's read together. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. And notice that he sits down to teach them. Now you're going to see this standing up and sitting down is a common theme in this story. And I believe it is a physical response to a spiritual thing that's happening in the realm. So when Jesus wants to calm things down, he sits. When he wants to elevate the conversation, he stands up. So they, he, the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. And they made her stand before the group. Stop right there. <clears throat> Does scripture speak to 21st century issues? I'm not a biological expert, uh, but it, apparently to me, if you get caught in the act of adultery, there's usually another person involved. So my question is, where's the dude? Have you noticed that the woman is the one getting shamed? The woman is being treated differently than her male counterpart. Now, that's not a new problem, is it, right? I mean, that there are two sets of rules, two sets of justices, people being treated different because of their gender or whatever. This is, this is a big issue, and Jesus is about to address it. So the guy gets off scot-free. The guy may be standing in the crowd for all we know. But it's the woman who's being embarrassed. It's the woman who's being ashamed. And now, listen to what they say. Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery in the law of Moses. They begin to correct Jesus as if Jesus did not understand the law. Very arrogant. They're making a lot of uh, assumptions. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? So think, think about the absurdity of this. The man who wrote the law, the man who was present when Moses was given the law, the author of the law is being told by mere humans how to interpret and enforce the law that he wrote. Jesus had to be, take a deep breath, like, how much longer, Lord Jesus? Well, I'll be here with these mere mortals. <laughs> I love them. I really do love them, but I don't like them all the time. And this is one of those moments. And they were using this question as a trap, as if Jesus did not know that. The all-wise one, the all-knowing one, knows when he's being tricked, right? So they, in order to have a basis for accusing him, but Jesus, listen, look what he does. He bends down. He de-escalates the situation. He takes a deep breath. And he starts to write on the ground with his finger. Now, let's just stop here for a moment because I know the question is, what was he writing? And nobody knows. Okay, if anybody tells you they know what he was writing, they don't know because the Bible doesn't tell us what he was writing. I have an opinion, though. I think it was the name of the dude. 
Or, here's another I think, that's, I think that's valid, another valid opinion, which again is just an opinion, is he was writing out all of their sins. The ones that also deserve punishment. You know, greed, lust, stealing, murderous thoughts, their own adultery. Maybe that was it. Either way, it unsettled everybody. Whatever he was writing made the room feel very uncomfortable. Could he, be, he could have just been doodling in the dirt. I mean, that's another possibility. And when they kept on questioning him, look what he does. He stands back up. Now, this is like a Catholic mass here, right? He's up, standing up, sitting down, standing up, sitting down about 12 times here. And he says that he straightened up and said to them, if any one of you is without sin, he said, if any one of you are without sin, he said, where am I? Okay, he, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stoops down, writes on the ground, and at this, all the old guys leave first. The older men, the older people in the room. Now, I have an opinion about that as well. I believe that when we get older, and I'm one and now, one of the older guys, not the oldest, but I'm older. I believe the older you get, the more aware of how much grace you have received and still need should become more and more in your life. I believe I, I'm living now because of grace. I was saved by grace. I have been sustained by grace. I, 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 I look ahead into my future today, tomorrow, the weeks to come, and I realize I'm going to need grace again. And for those of us who are swimming in oceans of grace, it should be easy for us to give a cup of grace to someone else when they have a need. And I love that the older ones, like, you know what, guys, this, this woman, she made a mistake, but haven't we all? And see, this is, this is the difference between being a mature follower of Christ and actually becoming like one of these Pharisees, one of these religious knuckleheads, the scholars who quite honestly thought they were closer to God than everyone else. The, the problem is, is when you don't regularly remind yourself of how much you've been forgiven, you stop forgiving people around you. But if you remind yourself every single day, I have been forgiven so much. I need forgiveness today. I am going to need forgiveness today. Therefore, when I bump into someone who's really made a mistake, who's really messed up, it should be easy for me to say, God bless you. May God forgive you. May God be with you. May the kindness of the Lord find you. And then at the, at the end, the older ones are gone until only Jesus is left. Now, this is the epic moment. Jesus is by himself with a woman caught in adultery. You know how many times Jesus found himself alone with broken women? The woman at the well, woman caught in adultery. Time and time again, Jesus was breaking these cultural norms, these social norms, to put himself at the place of healing, a place of brokenness. Women were considered property. Women were not even allowed to testify in court because they were not considered trustworthy during this time. They were, you were there for childbearing and to take care of the clothes, take care of the home. And Jesus gives her dignity. Jesus looks at her. Jesus looks her in the eye and brings strength into her life. Listen to what he said. He said, and the woman was still standing there. Jesus straightened up and he asked her, woman, where are they? <clears throat> where are all the perfect people that can throw rocks at you? Where are all the perfect people who have not sent themselves? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir. And then listen to the, okay, the next line, the next phrase tells you who Jesus is. So was he a good guy who grew up in Bethlehem and helped poor people? Yes. Was he a, a nice teacher who was able to tell a great story and a parable to make the Bible make sense to us? Yes. Was he born of a virgin, had a nice family? Was he falsely accused? Yes, all of that is true. But the message, the essence of who Jesus is, he's about to say it. The good news for all humanity is about to come out of his mouth. Listen to what he says. He says then, then neither do I condemn you. That is a very, a very clear use of scripture. The, the, the wording could not be more precise and more powerful. Neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, he said, then he says, and because of that, because I do not condemn you, 
I don't condone it. He did not say I, I, I condone it. He says your behavior, your obvious sin, does not bring you condemnation. There is a future for you. There is a hope for you. Your life is not over because of this sad mistake. This sin is not the end of you. Neither do I condemn you. Now go and be the woman that God's created you to be. Go now and dive into the oceans of grace that I've just introduced you to. And live there for the rest of your life. Go and leave your life of sin. When I read this story, I think about so many things. I think about this idea of being shamed, right? We're living in cancel culture right now where you, if you make a mistake, if you step on one of those social landmines that are out there, it can ruin your life. I mean, you can get shamed into resigning. You can get shamed into losing your job. You can get shamed into losing your friends. And it, it, this is an age-old tactic that people have used to control behavior, including parents. It is an age-old evil tactic for behavior modification. That's what shame is. It is a tactic to get people to change their behaviors, but instead of producing a better human, it leaves a broken human. Now listen, they made her stand before the group. They were trying to shame her. They were trying to embarrass her. And because of her shame and embarrassment, they thought that would move Jesus to do something to, to shame himself, to shame her. They thought that Jesus would pile on, and he did not. Can I just encourage you when someone around you has made a mistake and everyone else is piling on, maybe it's a chance for us to step back and not just pile on when it's so easy to pile on people. You see this online. Somebody made a mistake, they, they messed up, they, you know, and everybody piles on them. And maybe they need a piling on. I don't know. Depends on what they've done. But many times I find myself, I don't want to just pile on here. I don't want to just jump on, on the group. Let's, how about step away and find out the story? Let's, let's have some nuances to the story. And, but Jesus, if you read all of the teachings of Jesus, there's not one time where you find that Jesus shamed another person. When, when our kids were little, uh, Jack Hayford, he, at the time I was friends with him, an old saint, he's now in heaven. He was in his uh, 70s at the time, and our kids were just tiny. And I, I, had a, I had a car ride with him, and I said, hey, Pastor Jack, my kids are very little. Tell me, tell me some things that you learned about your children. And he told me a lot of things, but one thing he said to me, he said, Brady, we never use shame as a motivating tool to get our kids to change their behavior. He said phrases like this, you should be ashamed of yourself, or shame on you. You should be ashamed. He said, we, we never use that with our kids. He said, we don't use shame as a force to change their behavior because, because shame is not from the Lord. Shame is demonic. Shame is ugly. Shame is evil. In fact, what did Jesus do when he went to the cross? He took our shame upon himself. All of that shame that's been brought to you, all that shame that's been projected towards you in the room today, Jesus took that shame upon himself. You do not have to carry shame for the rest of your life. Jesus does not put shame on people who have sinned. And here's why. Because shame convinces us that there's no hope of ever changing or getting better. Every addict in the room, every person who's wrestled with mental health problems has felt that shame come over them. The, every person who's struggled with breaking addictions knows what that shame of, I messed up one more time. I, I, I'm never going to get this right. And that shame starts creeping in. That shame starts uh, uh, hovering about. It creates this aura of darkness around your soul. In fact, shame takes away our courage. The courage to actually change, shame takes that away. In other words, you'll start saying things to yourself like there's no use. I'm never going to lose this weight. I'm never going to stop looking at that porn. I'm never going to have, I'm, I, I can't stop drinking. I can't stop the heroin. I can't stop that. Shame creeps in and convinces us that we can no longer do it. And in verse 11, when he looks at her and says, neither then do I condemn you. I'm not, I don't condemn you. What he was doing is taking that shame off of her. What he was doing is telling her, listen, you messed up. Adultery's wrong. 
Go back to your family. Go back to your home. Go back to the place that, that I, I've given you. But don't walk back there condemned. Now listen to Romans chapter 8. Fast forward to all of the writers, Paul, James, John, uh, all of the writers, Luke, when they would write the rest of the New Testament, this idea of condemnation, this idea that you're not condemned would become one of the central stories that they would read, the central idea of the teachings of Jesus. In fact, let's read this out loud together as a confession over your own soul today. Will you read it out loud with me if you believe this? Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. Listen, I've got good news for you today. There is no condemnation over you if you love Jesus and Jesus knows you. None. No condemnation. Well, what does that say? Well, Brady, what is condemnation? Condemnation is when you make a final sentence over someone. You're always going to be this way. You have no hope. You have no future. That's exactly opposite of what Jesus told sinning people. Because of me, because of what I'm doing on the cross, I will take your shame, I will take your guilt, I will take your sin to the cross, I will pay the price for that so that you do not have to. I am going to a borrowed grave, I will be there three days, but the power of the Holy Spirit will raise me out of that grave, and what's going to happen? Condemnation comes off of us. Jesus gave her good news. She, was she guilty? Yeah, she was caught. I mean, if, there, if that would have been a jury trial, that would have been a quick jury trial. She's caught. She's guilty. So it's not about being guilty or innocent here. But she was not condemned. She was forgiven. She was given a new start. Listen, I think there's probably some guilty people in the room, including myself. Anybody here ever been guilty? Four of us? <laughs> We're all guilty, right? And, and listen... When the sentence is pronounced over your life, what you want to hear is what? You have been forgiven. Forgiven, not condemned. So let me just, let me just uh, separate this out for you for a minute because people get this confused. So, Pastor Brady, I, I believe that I'm not condemned, but why do I feel bad when I sin? That's conviction. That, in fact, that should be like a normal thing. Almost every day, I feel some types of conviction. I feel, I feel like a course correction. I mean, it's not, like, it's not like God coming and punching me every time I sin. That's not what I'm talking about. He's not standing over me with a stick, you know, like, pow, hitting my hands every time I mess up. Pow. That's not what I'm talking about. But throughout the day, there are nudges and course corrections. It's like typing in an address in your GPS on your car and you make a wrong turn. What does it do? Uh, go up here and make that right. You missed your turn. Let me give you a course. I'm going to get you back on course. Go up here, take a left, get back on course. That's conviction, right? And without that, you're going to stay lost all the time. You're going to end up in a bad place throughout the day. That's called conviction. Those nudges, those, those tr little troublings in your spirit when you know you need to go back to your husband and tell him, I didn't mean that. Or probably the husband going back and telling the wife, hey, I didn't mean that. Please forgive me. Telling your children, I'm sorry I was sharp with my words. I didn't, Dad's tired. Dad's not going to do that. I love you. Please forgive me. That's what, that's what that feels like, right? Condemnation says you're never going to change. You, you have the spirit of idiot on you, and it's never leaving you. Now, that feels a lot different than just, hey, you missed your turn. You're still on track take a left here, now you're headed in the right direction again. That's conviction. This woman, in front of Jesus this day, had been pardoned. And you know what? There's a big difference between being pardoned and paroled. Let me tell you a story, okay? And then I'll be done here in just a moment. A few years ago, I'm preaching at my church in Colorado, and I look down the left side of the aisle, and there's this really tall guy, six foot six, six foot seven guy, 
He was sitting right on the end of the row. He towered above everybody else. I'd never seen him in church before. And I thought, you know, he, he looked like a basketball player. And so I get through preaching and I walk down and he, this guy walks right to me. I mean, it makes a beeline for me. Say, hey, Pastor Brady, I know you're from the South. I, I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, but I spent the last 20 years of my life in the Mississippi Penitent, uh, State Penitentiary. I said, well, well, glad you're here. And he goes, can I tell you my story? Can I have lunch with you? And I want to tell you my story. And I said, sure. And we have uh, our services are broadcast into all the state uh, penitentiaries across the state of Colorado. Uh, it's our most exclusive campus. Uh, but we have hundreds, hundreds of inmates watching every single Sunday. I mean, we, I get letters. I get $5 tithe checks every week from inmates who want to just be a part of the church. And they, hundreds, are watching us every single Sunday. And so I have a heart for men and women who are trying to find hope in a, in a really dark place. Our prison systems are dark. And there are a lot of good people finding a lot of good salvation in our prison system. So he came, so we, I take him out to lunch. He said, Pastor Brady, when I was 18 years old, I had a college scholarship to play college basketball. It was, it was a summer between my high school year, my senior year in high school, my first year of college, we're in Memphis, Tennessee. I'm with a group of guys. I, I don't know them. I just met them. And we're, we're balling. We're having a three-on-three. Three. We're playing. We're all hot and sweaty. And one of the guys says to me, he says, hey, uh, we can go across the state line into Mississippi. You don't have to be but 18 to buy beer there. Let's go, for, let's go uh, on a beer run. So you're 18. Okay. I mean, it's, okay, bad, is that a bad decision? Yes. 18-year-olds are prone to doing stuff like this because I was 18 and I did that stuff. So they get in a car, go across the, into Mississippi, which is not that far. There was a liquor store. He goes, Brady, what, what I'm about to tell you happened in 30 seconds. We're walking into the liquor store, and one of the guys puts a revolver in my hand. And I, he said, what, what, are you, what are you doing? He goes, we're robbing this place. As I'm walking through the front door, they tell me, we're robbing this place. Here's a gun. And this, it can happen like this. He says, so I'm walking into the liquor store. The guy behind the counter realizes he's getting robbed by a bunch of young guys. He pulls up his shotgun and Brady, it's just, it, it was all, I was, it was self-defense. I thought I was, I was about to get shot. I fired my weapon, shot him once in the chest. He was dead before he hit the ground. I'm 18 years old. I've never been in trouble with the law. I've never been arrested. And I've just killed a man in cold blood over beer. He goes, my whole life, they arrest me. The, the trial is quick. It's on, on camera. I'm, I, I shoot the guy. I'm guilty. He's dead. I'm alive. He gets life in prison without the possibility of parole. He's 18 years old. No college basketball, no college sports. He goes, Brady, I'm in prison at 18 with grown men. And he said, it was hard. It was difficult. I had to fight. I had to survive. He said, For, by God's grace, my mom had taught me to cook. And I ended up in the, in the kitchen, the prison kitchen. And there I found some safety because I would be there all day long cooking meals for the other inmates. And he said, I was in there for like 10 or 12 years cooking in the, in the, in the kitchen, kind of working my way up through the, you know, the chain of command. And one day the newly elected governor of Mississippi showed up at my prison, was walking through our kitchen and happened to taste something that I was cooking. He goes, my goodness. You're better than anybody I have at my, my mansion. Ends up, the governor brings him in to his mansion, the governor's mansion in Mississippi, and for eight years, a, a van would pick him up at the Mississippi State Penitentiary, drive him to the governor's mansion, and he would cook breakfast, lunch, and dinner at the governor's mansion for eight years. He and the governor would sit around a table and have conversations about Jesus. The governor began to disciple this young man. He realized this is a young man that loves Jesus. He's a good cook. He's not a threat to society. So at the end, the last two weeks of the governor's term in Mississippi, the Mississippi governor pardoned this convicted killer. And it, was a, it was national news. Not everyone agreed with this. In fact, today... This young man that I'm talking about ha actually had to leave Colorado Springs a few years ago because there is a very nasty group of people in Mississippi that want him back in prison and they harass him, trying to get him to be violent again so that he could be put back in jail. So it's a, it's a sad story, but I'm not, that's where his story ends. 
And this is where your story begins. Because he explained to me that day at lunch the difference between being paroled and pardoned. When you've been paroled, a person is set free because of good behavior. And as long as you act right and be good and do good, you stay out of jail. But that's living like a parolee, always wondering if you make a mistake or you're going to fall out of good grace and end back up in the jail that you so despise. He goes, but Brady, he looked me in the eye, he goes, I've not been paroled. I've been pardoned. And that's what makes everyone so furious. He goes, my record has been wiped clean. You cannot find any record of my robbery or my murder in any legal documents. It's almost like, Brady, he says, like going into the waters of baptism and the old is gone and the new has come. The old man has passed away and someone new comes up out of that waters. He goes, Brady, the next time you baptize people, please tell them my story because when you're baptized in Christ, you're not paroled. You're pardoned. Amen. So when Jesus looked at this woman and says, yes, you are guilty. Yes, we caught you in adultery. But go now and leave your life of sin. What Jesus was saying to her is, you're pardoned. So Evergreen, I've come here today to remind myself and you that our life with Jesus is not a life living like a parolee. And some of you are living like a parolee today. If I be good today, maybe if I can go all day long today without sinning, I'll, I'll have, I'm out of prison one more day. That's not the life that Jesus went to the cross for you. That's not the cross at the resurrection. That's not the life that the resurrection provides for you. His life, his death, his burial, his resurrection was not for you to be paroled. It was for you to be pardoned. So I want to read one more section out here. We ended at Romans 8, chapter 2. Let's pick up in verse 5. Listen to this. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds, their attitudes set on what the Spirit desires. Verse 6 is the key. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Holy Spirit is life and peace. So I'm going to say three things, and, and the, these three things are true about you and they're true about me. Here, here's the first thing. Number one, we've all been guilty. If, if that's true, would you say amen? <laughs> There's only one sinless person. The rest of us are guilty. Right? We've all been guilty. It's okay to say that. So I've been guilty this week. I'm not going to tell you all the details, but I've, I've, I've had to ask for forgiveness. Anyone else in the room had to ask for forgiveness this week? And like, I'm doing my best. I, am a, I love my wife, love my children, love my church, but I don't always get it right. If you ever have a pastor say that, you don't trust that pastor. Don't trust any leader that tells you that they haven't been guilty. We've all been guilty. But there's a second thing that's also true. Jesus has come to pardon us. Aren't you grateful for that? He pardoned us. His grace is like a swimming in an ocean, quite honestly. And that's not a license to keep sinning. That's not, that's not why Jesus told the woman at the well, hey, because I've got all the, the grace you need, just keep doing what you're doing. He goes, no, go leave that life of sin. Leave. I have pardoned you. Now go live a better life. Go, go, go by my grace and live the life that I've created you to live. So we've all been guilty. Jesus came to pardon us. And here's the last thing that's true. We have the Holy Spirit. So life and peace are possible. I, I, I think I told you this a couple of years ago, but when I turned 50 years old, I felt like the Lord said, Brady, what do you want from me? You're, you're at halftime, Brady. And if, there may be an overtime, but you're at least at halftime. I mean, at 50, you can kind of assume that half your life kind of done. And I said to the Lord, I said, I want... I want to be close to you. I don't want to get to the end of my life and not know you. That's, that's it. I don't, wealth, fame, riches, glory, all that is vanishing. What if I could just get to the end of my life and really know who you are? Be close to you. Be near you. 
So he reminded me of a prayer that's being prayed in the church for 1,700 years. Come, Holy Spirit. So every morning for the last seven and a half years, I did it this morning. I was here in a hotel, woke up early this morning before I looked at my phone. I left my phone in his truck last night, so that was easy. So I didn't even have my phone. That was great. Didn't even have a phone this morning. And I said, come, Holy Spirit. That's not because I think the Holy Spirit ran off and left me or... You know, I'm not here to argue theology with you. I'm just saying the prayer is for me to remind myself today that I need the Holy Spirit for today. Give me today my daily bread. That's the prayer I'm praying. The older I get, the simpler my prayers are becoming. Give me today my daily bread. Lead me in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Come Holy Spirit. Simple stuff. Blocking and tackling, right? I had a young guy, he wanted to argue about it the other day. He said, Pastor Brady, I just need to know. I got to know. I got to know. Do I need the Holy Spirit to get to heaven? I said, dude, you need the Holy Spirit to go to Costco. Have you been there? (laughs) Now, I knew you would know that joke up here, right? And that's true, right? We need the Holy Spirit. Stand with me this morning. I want to pray for you, pray over you. I appreciate you letting me take your time today. I hope this has been helpful. I hope it's been encouraging to you. Uh, it's a joy to always be with you, Pastor Phil, and, and, and all of you, just your team. But I want to pray, just if it's okay, just turn your hands toward the Lord. You're not turning your hands toward me. You're turning your hands toward the Lord. And pray that three-word prayer with me. Make this a part of your daily lexicon, your daily prayer. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Come, Lord Jesus. Give us today our daily bread. Lead us in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. The Lord is my shepherd. Lord, we confess all of that today because we need you. We need you. We're all guilty, but you've already pardoned us. And we accept it today. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen.